And to start off our discussion of uh, Digital Galen is, is going to be uh, Doug Emery, who's uh, been involved in uh, these projects and is now a local boy <laughs> at the University of Penn in Pennsylvania. Uh, yes, as uh, Keith was saying, uh, my name is Doug Emery. I work here at the University of Pennsylvania, but I've been working with uh, Will and Mike and other members of the Alan uh, Palimpsest team since 2005 when I started working on the Archimedes Palimpsest. And in that time, I generated a number of uh, data sets like this, and they're all just as boring, as I'll show you in a moment. <laughs> um, the, uh, they look, this is uh, the the Archimedes Palimpsest is at a new home. It's here at the University of Pennsylvania, but it's uh, essentially the same data that was at the other website uh, for the Archimedes Palimpsest. And that was followed uh, by the Galen uh, Syriac Palimpsest. Uh, and the principles that were employed in the Galen and the Archimedes Palimpsest project was then applied to a website that we called the Digital Walters, which was a part, which was an effort to put online the digitized uh, medieval manuscripts at the Walters Art Museum. That project is still ongoing. Uh, and then now Open, which is putting online books and manuscripts that have been digitized from the University of Pennsylvania and the Philadelphia area. And for those of you who, like me, started playing around with the Linux operating system in 1995 and 1996 and went on sites like SunSite and started downloading files off of uh, uh, off of internet sites uh, in order to you know, install software on your, your operating system or poking around. This should look fairly familiar because what this is, is this is a simple directory listing. In fact, early web browsers combined HTML with simple directory listings. And what we have here, more or less, is a file server that's sitting on the web. And this is not what I would be doing when I came onto the Archimedes Palimpsest project. I was a web programmer and had been a web programmer for about five years. And I thought, well, we'll build a website. And then you'll be able to browse the images, and you'll be able to do this. And there'll be connections between uh, transcriptions and images, and it'll be great. And the owner said, no, we would just want That's all he wanted to have was data. And in fact, we didn't even think there would be a website. We thought that we'd be putting it on hard drives and distributing hard drives of data to people. And it took us a while to get that that's what we were really going to be able to do was just put the data online, but eventually we said, okay, that's what we'll do, and so we put the data online as data. And there's a couple of things about that. One, it's a lot of work. It's actually quite hard to assemble all of this data into a single package and to get it online. And the other, and more important, is that it's a really powerful idea, which is what Will has been uh, talking about for years now. Uh, when he talks about his concept of the fridge. That's what we provide. It's the fridge of data that you can come to and get the information that you want. So what, what's the structure of these websites? Well, I'm going to focus on the Galen project, which again was the second project that we worked on and how we constructed that data set. I'm mostly, mostly going to focus on the initial data set that is, arose from the 2010 imaging sessions that took place from, March, uh, from February 24th to March 12th of that year, we did 230, 230 conjoined single leaf uh, sides from the disbound codex, and you about how the, uh, the manuscript was imaged, how it was disbound, and how it's now been put back together. Uh, there, so this, that is to say there were 115 conjoins or, or single leaves, and we did each side of that, uh, each side of each one of those. In four later sessions, 12 sides of six leaves have been imaged from the National the Houghton Library, the Vatican Apostolic Library, and St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai, I'm sure, uh, which Mike has talked about. And there's also been a session to re-image 10 sides from the bound codex, which we're hoping to have online soon. So what's online now? Uh, there are 230 sides from the 210 session, the 12 sides I just mentioned from uh, other repositories. Missing, again, are the 10 re-image sides from the codex. There are 6,670 TIFF images, 318 gigabytes of data, and 242 total sides. Uh, 2010 session, again, we did two, 230 sides. And each one of those 230 sides was imaged as a part of what we call 
the term, uh, an imaging sequence. So will, you, you put the image down on a, you put the leaf down on a copy stand and you turn the lights off and you have lights that are positioned around the, the, the leaf, camera over the top and you press a button and then the software proceeds to take 23 separate images of each one of those, uh, of, of that side in a sequence. And for each one of the, the sequences, we did at least one side. Uh, in fact, we probably did uh, four, three to four of most of the sides because we would have mistakes and this is reflected mistakes or we'd want to try different things and so this is reflected in the naming of the files, which I'll talk about in a minute. Of those 23 images, we did 13 uh, wavelengths you, and then we did three capture modalities, reflectance imaging, um, reflectance imaging, color filters, six images, and raking image four, breaking images, images uh, four. There were 39, we used a 39 megapixel camera, and each one of the captures was 3.6 gigabytes. Uh, the capture itself was 1.8 gigabytes of raw data. This was then immediately uh, developed by the camera software, and, and that's the size of that data set was another uh, 1.8 gigabytes and the total was 3.6 gigabytes per capture. If you figure that we did 500 uh, total sequences and we did more than that, you can see how that began to add up really quickly. Lots and lots of images taking up lots of hard drive space. Uh, these were 16-bit uh, uh, images and each image was 78 megabytes apiece. This is what the capture images look online. Here they're broken up into the three uh, groups that I was describing earlier. Uh, the, the, the reflectance images, uh, the and then the four raking light images. This is what processed images look like online. Uh, these images are named the same as the, uh, as the capture images. That is, each image begins with a folio side designation. Usually it's a conjoin. It's followed by a letter. The letters are between A through E. A through E designates which one of the sequences uh, the capture came from. Uh, we each folder that's in the data directory, and I'll show you that in a moment, only contains the images from a single sequence. So it'll only be A, or it'll be B, or it'll be C, and so forth. Uh, what, uh, the, the work after the images were captured, figure out which one of the capture sequences was the preferred one. And a lot of that work was done by Keith Knox, who was doing the initial evaluation of the capture images. Uh, the sequence letter is followed by a code that tells you the type of capture image or processed image that you're looking at. And this is explained in the documentation on the website, which So the main goal here is preservation and access, or now and the future. As, been point, you know, as we all know, the, the book itself is over 1,000 years old. And digital data sets are much more volatile than uh, parchment manuscripts. And so the question is, how do we make this last? And I would if that ends up lasting 50 years, that would be great. If it ends up lasting 100 years, I think that would be outstanding. Um, and, so, and so the question is, how do you achieve that? And the way that you achieve that is by carefully designing your archive so that it is integrated and self-documenting. And what we did was the guidelines that have set up by the Open Archival Information System model, which Will was talking about earlier. This is the uh, data preservation model that was developed by the international uh, space agencies to uh, figure out a way to capture and preserve their digital they had uh, found that it was hard to preserve before. The core content of this is flat files. It's TIFF images and text. Uh, it isn't proprietary spreadsheet documents. It isn't proprietary word processing documents. Uh, it is files that are intended to preserve the data at its best quality and for the longest period of time, and to be accessible for the longest possible period of time. And the selections in the file types were made uh, with that in mind. And it is, it is data and metadata. The TIFF images are the data, and everything else, in one way or another, is metadata that supports images and adherence to standards. The standards that we employ are, uh, again, for the data, TIFF version 6.0, our metadata, primarily based on the Archimedes Palimpsest metadata standard, which draws significantly from Dublin Core for content metadata, as well as the content standard for digital geospatial metadata for our spatial uh, metadata describing the orientation of the images. 
Unicode 5.0 for the text files, and then the extensible metadata platform, XMP, which is uh, originally an Adobe specification and now uh, a standard, an accepted standard for, international standard for the sharing of metadata about media files. So it's used for, here we're using it for images, but it's also used for uh, audio files, visual files, PDFs, other types of media files. The Archimedes Palimpsest metadata has six types of information that it provides. Identification for the image itself, not its content, but the image itself as a unique entity. Spatial information, this is coming from the geospatial standards that we employ, describing the orientation of the object within the scene. Uh, imaging and spectral data reference information, this is information about how the image was captured. Uh, data type information, the format of the file, as well as for processed images, how that file was generated. Data content information, this is the actual information about the subject of each one of the images, and metadata reference information. The actual data set looks like this in diagram. Uh, there's a readme file, which is intended to help orient the user, a list of all the files that are in the data set, and the core of the data is in the data folder. This is where all of the images are, and then metadata that, that uh, pertains to each one of those images. Supporting this are the documents folder. This includes both uh, external documentation of the standards that we employ, as well as internal documentation that describes how to understand the data set itself. Supplemental information, uh, this is actually not used in the Galen data set. It was used in the Archimedes Palimpsest project. It stored uh, treatise length transcriptions of the documents that the uh, undertext of the Archimedes Palimpsest, and then supporting the support directory, which is uh, technical content files like CSS, XML, schemas, uh, nerdy, geeky things that people like I, like me, like. The research contrib directory is actually important for people who are using the data set and would be and are interested in. The also contains image, images, as does the data directory. These are images that are important but do not conform to the core data. So for instance, if there were alternate takes of, uh, of a folio that, that we decided not to use in the main core data directory, these would be found in Research Contrib. So I encourage people who are using there uh, for possible images that may be useful to them. This is what it looks like when you go online. This is, it up, this is the information up close. These are the directories that uh, uh, I was showing, or that, you've, that I was just in the, that were in the diagram there. The external uh, documents directory, and here you see documentation of the different standards that were employed on, in the creation of the data set. And then this is the content of the internal documents directory. Here is our files that document the software that was used to generate the images, the Archie 1.0 PDF file. I mean, conventions that were used, which explain uh, how, the, how to interpret the file names that you, see on this, that you see in the data set, an index of the folios that are in the bound codex, the Ar Archimedes Palimpsest image metadata standard, a readme on using on how to check the integrity of the files, which I'll refer to in a moment. Uh, and a metadata data dictionary. Uh, here is the Archimedes Palimpsest metadata standard from the site, and here is the con uh, a section of the file naming conventions file, which provides information about uh, the secret codes that are in the file names to help you interpret what each one of those files is. Uh, this is the data folder. Uh, each one of the uh, folders in the data folder represents a sequence of images of a particular, of a particular uh, folio or conjoined side. Inside each one of these directories, this is the kind of you'll see. And I'll point out that there are, um, I'll point out that you'll see that there's a, a TIFF image, there's an MD5 file, and there's an XMP file, and then a JPEG. Uh, that you'll find this for each one of the images that, that is, that's in that of images for that conjoined side. The files, uh, and this is uh, just an explanation of what each one of those files is. These are the, the, the TIFF image itself, the corresponding JPEG thumbnail, which is one-tenth the size of the, J, of the TIFF image, an XMP data sidecar file, which I'll show you in a moment, and then an MD5 checksum file, which can be used to, ver to verify the validity 
of the, the integrity of the file if, once you've downloaded it. Uh, and as an experiment, yesterday I actually ran a complete check over the entirety of the data set and every single one of the files that's on the data set validate. So they're still good. Uh, this is an image of, this is the thumbnail image. This is the content of the image description tag for this image of one recto for a verso. Uh, this, Im this gives us a brief of part of the Archimedes Palimpsest metadata standard. Uh, these, are the these are mostly what you see here in front of you. These are all Dublin core fields, except for the one at the very bottom, which identify uh, what this image is, who captured it, uh, the sub information, publisher, contributor, image type, and so forth. This is the same information in the XMP sidecar file, which is an XML method for rendering, uh, for rendering, uh, image, again, is for rendering image metadata. Further down is information about how the image was generated. Uh, this is detailed information provided uh, by Keith Knox. It describes the process that he employed to create this image and the software that was, that was used for it. So the key concepts that we, that, we that we employ in creating these data sets are adherence to standards, and I know Mike has talked about this, uh, a simplicity of format, TIFF images, flat files, Consistency and predictability. We want people and machines to be able to use uh, these data sets. All of the files, as much as possible, are named, uh, are named in the same way. It's all structured in exactly the same way. An integration of metadata and data. So in each, in each image header is the description of what that image is uh, using the Archimedes Palimpsest metadata standard. Each image is accompanied by an XMP sidecar, sidecar file that contains that same information. And then documentation that helps you understand the, the structure of the data set itself as well as the bit structure of the files that it contains. Thank you. Uh, the, next we have uh, two from the University of Manchester who have been working with the data online. Uh, the first one uh, is, is uh, Bill Sellers. Hi there. Uh, need the mic. Oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. I won't be able to move. I'll, I'll stay where I am. Uh, so uh, I'd just like to thank um, William Knoll for coming to come along for organizing the symposium and all of you who've managed to make it to this uh, late stage in the afternoon. So I'll try and keep this uh, fairly short and, and hopefully um, interesting. So unlike everyone else that you've um, had speak to you today, I'm not a, a long-term manuscript analyst. Uh, I'm actually a medical imaging specialist, and uh, I've been working with Peter for about the last year or so, uh, looking at what we can do with the images that he generates. Uh, and obviously, we, uh, we were successful at getting AHOC funding to have a look at the uh, silicon, uh, the silicon, the Syriac Galen Palimpsest. So I set myself uh, goals for doing this analysis. Um, the point is not to get bogged down in the technology. We're not here to produce pretty images of the palimpsest. We are here to aid the people who want to read the palimpsest. So, so my role is, as part of the team, but to actually help the scholars do what they need to do. So I'm looking to maximize readability, um, and I'm looking to provide a, a workflow, because we've got a lot of pages in the, this manuscript. And so it's no good if, if the image analysis takes a week for each document, because that's just going to slow us down too much. Um, I also think the workflow eventually needs to be something that can be controlled directly by the scholars, because only no, they know what they need out of the images. It's, it's very difficult for them to explain to me what I might have to do. And I can see things that matter for me, but that's not the ultimate goal. And of course, I want to maximize the information availability from these multispectral images. So we put a lot of effort uh, into taking the images. A lot of effort's been made making them available. And so my job is to maximize the information. So the 
lots of pictures of these images, and I thought I'd, I'd pick a, a slightly different one. Uh, this is uh, 226 Verso, and this is the, uh, the piece of uh, parchment that was actually stuck on the back of the binding, uh, and it was only recently uh, realized that it actually had text on it, and it was actually text that would probably the main body of the book. And I chose this as an example because it's a little bit simpler, um, because it doesn't actually have any overtext at all. Uh, this is entirely a, an undertext um, thing. And then I thought I'd move up to the added problems of overtext when we got there. And, and this is what, um, what it looks like if those of you who actually went and saw the book. In an optical image, the, the undertext is mostly very faint. But in some situations like this one, you can see faint traces of, of undertext. So obviously, this isn't in and of itself readable. So we need to do something. This is just a, a color image of the page. And like all um, color images, it's uh, made up of a, a red, a green, and a, a blue component. And actually, simply by um, looking at the individual components, you can actually see where the information that's making this readable is coming from. And actually, the information in this case is coming on the blue channel. So it's really only in the blue. If you look at the red or, um, or the green uh, channels, you'll see no distinction at all between the undertext um, and, the, and the parchment that it's on. But in the blue channel, yeah, you can still see that there is a, a slight difference there. And of course, that's because it's the shorter wavelengths of light that are picking out what's left of the text on the parchment. So if blue's good, well, there's a very, very good chance that ultraviolet, which of course is an even shorter wavelength than the blue, will be better. So what can we see in the ultra ultraviolet uh, uh, channel? So this isn't anything that's gone wrong with my computer. This is actually what you see in the ultraviolet channel. And this was um, the cameras that are used um, for the imaging. So this was imaged rather later than the rest of the, um, so, uh, the, rest of the SVP. And, um, this is what's known as a 16-bit camera. So this is like when you switch your phone to high dynamic range imaging. It's actually got a lot more than your eye can see. And so this is the, the, the raw image. But actually, all you have to do is, is, is read the image into something like Photoshop, which is a, you know, a very, very uh, good photo editing piece of software. And, and you can actually, in Photoshop, you can get up what are called um, show you the distribution of the uh, light intensities in your image. And actually, you probably can't quite see. But in this one, they're basically all concentrated down by the black end of things. And actually, all you have to do is click the little auto button in Photoshop, and it will spread out the, uh, the available image intensity. And this is actually um, what the UV image is actually revealing. So this is the, the sort of very, very straightforward um, application of a fairly standard piece of software to the image. And, and suddenly, this is a lot more legible. Uh, simply by looking at an image taken with the right wavelength of light, we actually have um, a very clear representation. We had to do a little bit of work to get the, the information maximized. But, but in fact, um, you know, this is getting towards the stage where it might be possible for a scholar to read. So if it's not quite good enough, uh, or it's going to be slightly harder to read than we would like, what sort of things can we do to improve the legibility of the text that we have? Well, the first stage, really, is to actually analyze what's there. And to analyze what's there, we need to compare the uh, intensities that we've got for the text that we can see and the intensities that we've got for the underlying parchment. And so what we can do is we can select points on the image. And what I've done here is I've shown where I've selected points. The ones in red, little red crosses, are all on the parchment. And the little green crosses are actually all areas where you've actually got visible letters. And we can see then, we can analyze the image to see whether there's anything actually worth looking at. And because the images that we've taken in all the different um, wavelengths of light are all aligned perfectly, so we know exactly where they are. We can also compare all the other images, even the ones where we couldn't actually, by eye, see any underlying text. And we can actually produce a, a map, uh, an intensity distribution map like this. And we can see what hint of information there might be in the different channels that we've got. 
And what you've got to look at here is that we've got two things. You've got the parchment in blue, and you can see that at these sort of red wavelengths, there's really no difference. You can't actually see any difference between the text and the parchment in those wavelengths. But in some of the fluorescent um, shots that we've got, actually, there's really quite a big difference between um, the parchment text. So those would be good areas to look at. And we're looking at with the ultraviolet. And whilst the actual overall intensities are very, very low, actually the separation is quite good. And the error bars give you an indication of spread. So in fact, this is why once I amplified this up using Photoshop, why it worked so well, because the separation is quite good. And so a graph like this is telling me the sorts of techniques that I might want to use to improve the legibility of the text. So it's a really useful first bit of analysis. So what can we do um, to improve legibility? So the techniques that you've heard about earlier today um, are all quite, uh, I'm going to say automatic techniques, because they're not. There's an awful lot of, of, of user input in. But I'm going to talk about techniques where actually what we do is we train the software as a way of maximizing the readability. Um, and I'm actually going to borrow some techniques um, that were developed in the 1940s by this chap, uh, R.A. Fisher. Lots of people don't like him very much. He's basically the father of modern statistics. Anyone who dislikes statistics, he's the guy you've got to blame because pretty much before Fisher, there wasn't any. People just reported their results. But he put us on a much um, firmer footing. And actually, the thing about statistics, you may not like statistics, but they actually, they make you much more effective um, scientists. You can produce a lot more science in a given amount of time, and you don't waste your time. So that actually is quite useful. And he came up with this technique called canonical variance analysis. He came up with loads of other techniques. But he actually came up with it because he was interested in quantifying the differences between different sorts of flowers, actually. Lots of measurements from these different sorts of irises. And he used this technique as a way of illustrating that these were different species, and which measurements with the important ones for identifying the different species. But the thing about image data is it is just data. It is no different. It is no different from financial data. It is no different from any numerical information that you're trying to understand. Um, you may well all have heard of big data and how you know, people like Google know more about you than you do yourself because they've mined all the data that they have about you and about everyone else on the planet. And so these sorts of techniques are big data techniques, and they give you ways of exploring data sets, and they give you very good ways um, of finding out what you need to find out. So we can use techniques like CVA and lots of other ones um, as an image enhancement technique, um, because what CVA does, this is a set of equations. It's all right, I'm not going to put the equations up here. The, and what they do is they, they maximize the, the, different, the, the difference between the different categories whilst minimizing the variation within the categories. And that may sound like a useless thing to want to do with an image, but actually what it does maximizes the contrast between the things that you've told it you're interested in. So if I tell it I'm interested in text and parchment, it will find a way of combining all those different multispectral images that will maximize the contrast uh, between the things I'm interested in. So this is a useful technique. And we can see how well it works because we can actually do the analysis. We do a canonical variate analysis and it produces what we call canonical axes. It doesn't really matter. But we can actually plot um, the points that I took um, off the image. And you can see that they're basically separated. So this is my parchment cluster and this is my uh, cluster from the, from the text. And there's, there's good separation, so it's found a way of separating out these two clumps. So it should work um, to produce a reasonably high contrast image. So we can take that image we had before, and we can run it through this technique using the training data that I've got from the, uh, the points that I marked in red and blue. Um, and this is the outcome. So this is what's happened after we've put it through this thing. And it doesn't look all that much better. I have to say. And that's the reality of this. Um, I and mean, one of the things we have to be cautious about you know, is this question of whether it's better to do all this complicated analysis and produce this one over here, or whether actually we could read everything we wanted from a very simple analysis just by optimizing the contrast in Photoshop. Because 
whilst I would say this does look a bit better, I'm not sure exactly how much more legible it would be. And that's where the person who's trying to read it would have to feed back to me whether it's worth all that extra effort. I, I did actually go through this. There are some very specific things that, that have happened that you can spot if you look at it. So for example here, um, what's happened in the numeric approach is we've managed to look through all this, all this mess of data and it, it's completely cleaned it up. Um, and so it might well be a lot less harsh on the eye to try and read what's here. It, it might also be a, a little bit less ambiguous. Um, there's a patch where actually you've got this quite dark mark. And although this doesn't look like text, because you know what text looks like as a reader, if you imagine that that dark blob was actually much closer to a, a letter shape, it could easily change the reading of something. And as you can see on the canonical variation, it's gone. So it is quite important sometimes to be able to identify these things as artifacts. But I'd also say that in some places, like down here, I would say the, the contrast here is actually worse. Um, and actually, particularly on some of the um, letter shapes around here, possibly the raw data or the minimally operated data is actually clearer. So there is no magic bullet. There is no way that a single technique is going to magically make this the best image. Uh, this is one technique out of the arsenal of techniques that we can provide that will hopefully make things uh, clearer and easier. But absolutely, the simple approach first, which really anyone who can use Photoshop can do, is, is probably well worth it because you can actually do a lot, particularly with the better of our images. Um, of course, a lot of times we're trying to deal with um, the overtext. So this is the, the Sharpie images. This is one of the ones that's um, uh, on the website that you can download and have a look. And, and this is a very nice but, but quite carefully, manually curated and treated image um, for basically trying to remove the overtext and make the, the underlying, the undertext as visible as possible. And one of the things that we're really very interested in doing is trying to improve these, and particularly trying to improve the areas where the overtext is obscuring the undertext. Because in this manuscript, it happens quite a lot. Um, and there is a hint that in some places, you can start to, to possibly see underneath the overtext. And that would be a major achievement and could really help legibility. So this is what I mean about the undertext and overtext. So this is from the Sharpie image. And I've enlarged it up, so hopefully you can actually see. And obviously, you can see areas of parchment here. This is the sort of um, reddish color in this particular one. You can very clearly see um, the overtext, which in this um, Sharpie processed image has been made this very uniform sort of gray color. Uh, you can see very clear undertext in this nice sort of pale blue color. Um, but obviously, you can't see at all areas where the overtext um, obscures the undertext infer that there might be undertext there in situations where you've got a line from a letter that obviously starts at one side and obviously ends at the other side. Probably there's undertext there. So that means that we do probably have enough information to actually do the training. So I can go through, and just like I did before with the text situation, I can identify areas of parchment, areas of overtext, areas of undertext, and areas where my best guess is that there are probably both. And I can do exactly the same as I did before, produce my intensity distribution, and see whether there are hints of areas that I might be able to um, see a difference between them. You can see here, again, in the ultraviolet area, uh, you're getting very good distinction between um, the, the, basically the overtext, the undertext, and um, the parchment. But if I look at the, uh, <coughs> the, where you've got both, and you've just got overtext, there's really no distinction. Whereas actually up at the infrared, we're starting to see some hints that there might be some evidence of a detectable <laughs> undertext underneath areas with overtext. And that's really the holy grail that we're trying to achieve. Um, we can do that analysis like I did before, where we, we plot these out. And you can see the problem very clearly here. Um, so I've got my current parchment nicely separated. This cluster doesn't touch any others. Overtext, nicely separated. This cluster doesn't touch anywhere else. Others. But actually, oh no, this is not so good. So this is undertext and areas. So this is actually overtext and areas with overtext and undertext. And there's no separation. 
But the thing is, this is just looking at the first two axes. And actually, if we, we can extend these, we get loads of these. And actually, if you look at the, um, the next set of axes, you're starting to see a hint of separation here. So I would say that the centroid of this green cluster is down here, and the centroid of this bluish cluster here. And there's definitely areas that overlap. So it might well be worth doing this. This might well give us a hint of what's underneath. And we can apply that to an image. And this is the sort of result that we'll get. And you said before, this is the overtext. Before, the overtext was very solid in color. Whereas here, we are starting to get hints of areas where we're seeing discoloration in this overtext. And this, I think in some places, is absolutely associated with hints of undertext coming through. And if you're trying to do a, a reading and you're not sure about one letter in the middle, and that might be the key word, then that might, in some situations, be exactly the extra bit of information you need to take you to the next stage. Mostly, it's not going to be necessary at all. Mostly, you can read the undertext or you can't. But sometimes, it is worth putting the extra effort in um, to really go that little bit further, because it might be important. So yeah, so it's still an open question. I think in some cases, we probably can also uh, moving to using some of the, uh, the sort of more original, less processed data, which I'm hoping will have, again, just that little bit more information that we can try and extract, which in these edge cases might be really important. But there are other things that we need to deal with. We need to deal with regional variation within the manuscript. And, um, you know, we're looking at very select uh, pages. But if you've seen the, uh, the codex, every page is different. Different bits of every page are different. You've got water damage in one area. It's been increased a bit in another area. So you know, we're going to have to do quite a lot of work on that. And of course, at the moment, the software isn't easy to use at all. Um, and I really, I really want to get into a situation where the person doing the training uh, is the person who has a particular goal to why they want to see something. Because that's when it's really worthwhile. It's when the person who's trying to read it uh, wants to do it. And there's nothing in this that's particularly difficult. If you're happy using Photoshop, then this isn't really very much different. It's, it's Photoshop, but we click on a few points first. And, and so it, it ought to be usable, and I think that's very important. So, so in, in terms of future work, and, and, and Cornelia will talk a little bit about this because he's been doing all of the uh, back-end maths, um, it is to produce an interactive, hopefully in collaboration with lots of other people, um, that provides a usable front end to these multi-dimensional statistical tools for analyzing images. Um, I think we still need to do a little bit of work on uh, workflow. Um, you've got to manually train this. Uh, the moment I picked the number 50 out of thin air, I think 10 is probably too many. I think 500 is probably too, 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 you know, too much work. Um, but I don't know. And, and it really is in terms of what the users want to gain out of this so that we can actually maximize the readability of these documents. OK, I shall pass you over. Our next speaker is also from the University of Manchester, and this is uh, Cornelio Arsene. And he's going to be talking a little bit about the different processing that he's done on the data that, that they've used from the website. Uh, right. Uh, my name is Mr. Cornelio Arsene. Uh, I'm from University of Manchester. Um, I, I work uh, with uh, Professor Peter Porman and Dr. Julian Silva, who just presented before me. Um, and um, the title of my presentation is uh, Revealing the Palimpsest. Um, <clears throat> the, road, my, the roadmap of the Gallen Palimpsest dimensionality reduction methods, um, the application of dimensionality reduction methods to the Gallen Palimpsest, uh, plug-in for ImageJ software, and uh, conclusions. Um, right, some, several, um, my, my, our work uh, at Manchester is uh, supported by a, a new United Kingdom Arts Humanity Research Council project, uh, which is entitled the Gallen Palimpsest Gallens on Simple Drugs and the Recovery of Lost Text Through Sophisticated uh, Imaging Techniques. Uh, principal investigator Professor Peter Porman and co-investigator Dr. William Sellers and Dr. Siam Bairo. <clears throat> 
Why is the Galen Palimpsest important? Um, there is more text than in the other historical co copy of the translation made by Sergius of Reshaina of Galen's on simple drugs, which exist in London in British Library. Uh, better readings than in the other historical copy existent in a uh, British library, relevance to Greek source text, relevance to text and development of uh, Greek or Arabic translation technique. Uh, finally, I able to address the role of Sergius versions of uh, Hunayn school. But uh, how can we study this um, palimpsest? Uh, one, uh, one way by um, enhanced image capture and uh, uh, followed by complex image process. Um, in complex, uh, we so my work uh, at, uh, at um, uh, Manchester University uh, is mainly um, with regard to the complex image processing. Uh, there are several um, uh, topics uh, uh, regard, uh, with regard to this. Uh, so to consider an optimal workflow, uh, how many samples, how many regions, what methods offer the best results. Uh, how to combine various methods to optimize images, uh, what are the future data collection options, uh, and to produce an interactive tool that allows scholars to use uh, these and other approach approaches on multispectral images. The technical goals are to maximize the readability of the undertext in the Galen Palimpsest, uh, to provide an efficient, repeatable, repeatable methodology to produce the, um, the image, uh, investigate the information available in the existing multispectral images, and uh, for to, uh, various mo um, to uh, try various methods of multispectral images. Um, so complex uh, image processing, there are various ways to improve the quality of an image by deblurring enhancement such as double thresholding uh, or dimensionality reduction methods. Um, dimension, dimensionality reduction methods. Um, so other image processing methods, although capable to provide workable images of undertext, for example, in the gutter region of a folio, are unable to show when there is undertext beneath the overtext. Uh, as uh, some uh, my previous speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Sellers, um, uh, said, uh, canonical variance analysis seem already uh, uh, the best method, uh, as it has uh, uh, the characteristics that you can uh, that uh, you can see on the slide. Um, first of all, uh, as I mentioned already, this uh, double trace holding techniques. So basically, the dark, uh, darker overtest is carefully identified by the human operator and color in white, which is trace hold one, and then the remaining under test, which is black but not as black as the overtest was, is made even darker. Uh, this last, this um, in, this technique shows some initial very good results, but its success depends on the human operator in selecting suitable cutting values. Uh, so I uh, simple double trace holding technique to this page uh, 102v, uh, 102r of the Galen palimpsest on the page obtained with the ultraviolet illumination with green color filter. Um, and the results, uh, I don't know if it's visible there in the picture, but the results uh, were quite uh, good. Uh, then I work on these uh, dimension dimensionality reduction methods, uh, which are methods of reducing the number, number of features or random variables under consideration. So it transforms the data from a high dimensional space to a space of fewer dimension. Uh, there are many techniques which, are, uh, which have been developed in the past, uh, such dimensionality reduction methods. <laughs> And you can see um, listed uh, several of them. Um, in uh, my work, I use um, um, at the beginning I use a um, um, toolbox from MATLAB for dimensionality reduction, which contains 32 methods. Um, and uh, a number of of these methods were uh, very very good, um, such as linear discriminant analysis, neighborhood component analysis, generalized discriminant analysis, diffusion maps. Isomap, landmark isomap, uh, probabilistic principal component analysis, principal component analysis, uh, Gaussian process latent variable model. Uh, some of these uh, methods are unsupervised, uh, other ones are supervised. Uh, difference between the unsupervised and supervised methods um, is that uh, in the case of the unsupervised, um, you may not need um, um, so in the case of, uh, of the supervised method, a number of points are used to determine the model while knowing the classes uh, of the respective points. So if it's, uh, the respective points represent uh, manuscript, parchment, um, and so on. Uh, while in the case of the unsupervised, uh, it's not necessary to know um, uh, which classes the points belong to. <clears throat> 
but it's better to to know uh, actually. Um, then uh, so application to the Gallen palimpsest of uh, this dimensionality reduction uh, methods. Uh, here you have an example of the of um, eight channels uh, obtain um, so the peak. Uh, obtained for eight channels for this page 102v107. So I applied the dimensionality reduction methods uh, to this page. And then, uh, so then you can see um, the various um, uh, uh, results for the methods that uh, worked. So the linear analysis, uh, this is um, this this method is uh, kind of similar with the canonical variates analysis, and it gave uh, uh, for me it looks good, uh, but I don't know how uh, it looks for the scholars. Um, then uh, this one is uh, neighborhood component analysis, another supervised method, so another dimensionality. Again, this one seems to give a good result for this page. Uh, this one is a generalized discriminant analysis, again a supervised method. <clears throat> This one is diffusion maps, is an unsupervised uh, nonlinear dimensionality reduction method, again for the same page uh, applied. Uh, this is an uh, isomap, uh, is an unsupervised nonlinear dimensionality reduction method applied to the same page. Um, this, is, this is a comparison between the isomap, um, just, I just took a, a square, and the uh, ultraviolet illumination with green color filter. Uh, but this, this is a, uh, this and did not give the best uh, results from all the methods. Uh, it's just for comparison purposes uh, on this slide. Uh, this one is landmark isomap, again, a, a method which gave uh, better results than other methods. Uh, this is a pro uh, probabilistic uh, principal component analysis method. Uh, <clears throat> Then probabilistic pr uh, principal component analysis, basically this, uh, these two methods gave the same result. Uh, then uh, this is a Gaussian process latent variable model. Again, is an extension of the probabilistic uh, principal component analysis. So uh, these three methods uh, gave uh, kind of similar result. Uh, so the, uh, linguists uh, or scholars identified the images produced by the canonical variance analysis methods as having the best quality. Uh, they were able to quantify also the improvements achieved to the new produced image, uh, images as compared to the original multispectral images. Uh, now the question um, was: uh, Is there a numerical way of comparing the images? Um, uh, so not by uh, asking the the scholars. Uh, so the objective is to see the undertext. Uh, there are in the in the literature there are some um, uh, computational indexes for uh, uh, assessing uh, the clusters, uh, basically the images, um, and. Um, and then uh, one of these is index is called davis Baldin Index uh, for evaluating uh, these methods. Uh, I use uh, 200 points, uh, so the dimensionality reduction method was um, uh, trained with 200 points. Uh, the scope is to, um, to distinguish between the cluster of the parchment and the cl cluster of the underwriting. So you want to have uh, the parchment as white, for example, as white as possible, and the underwriting very black. I mean, we, uh, so that to see uh, clearly. Uh, so this uh, RIJ, uh, which is a separation between the two clusters. And uh, in, the ca in case of this index, davis Baldin, the uh, lower the value, the better the separation of clusters. Uh, so I uh, try. I calculated um, this index for all these methods, these dimension reduction methods that I presented on the previous slides, and uh, canonical variance analysis seem to have uh, the smallest value, 0 0.05, uh, followed by the linear discriminant analysis, 0 0.2, and so on. Uh, the worst methods, uh, the you can see down to 3.5. Um, um, they, so this, this, the, the confirm basically the visual assessment. Um, right. Then another index I tried uh, was is the Dan index. Uh, is uh, basically minimum distance between cluster I and J, and uh, over the maximum distance in a cluster over all clusters. Um, and then, uh, but this uh, also gave um, uh, some uh, good results, but uh, not uh, maybe not so good as the as the previous index. In this case, um, uh, the um, uh, the index has to have the highest value. And but again, the 
Various analysis, the linear discriminant analysis, uh, the, my, the diffusion maps, uh, and so on. They have the uh, they ha have the the best values. Uh, you can see the difference between CVA, which is, which is 32, and the second method, which is linear discriminant analysis, which is 7.65. So it's basically a default. Uh, it looks like. Uh, but uh, um, of course, this uh, in the in the case of this index uh, it might be needed more than 200 points uh, in order to to be sure of the of the of the results. Right. Uh, next step was to develop a, a plugin for ImageJ soft, software, uh, so which to be used by the scholars um, in order to apply this dimensionality reduction methods to the Galen Palimpsest. Um, this ImageJ software you already probably uh, noticed it uh, on the pre previous presentation. So it's a Java-based image processing software. National Institutes of Health from uh, from United States. Uh, it's an open architecture software which gives the possibility to add other function procedures by writing Java plugins or uh, recordable macros. Uh, it can run on different operating systems. Uh, the way it works, it calls a Java. Java is a, a programming language calls a plugin which is uh, written in Java and then uh, this uh, small uh, program uh, this small plugin in Java calls uh, or either can call a MATLAB uh, can either call MATLAB software implementing the canonical variates analysis or I can either call a C C++ uh, uh, implementing the canonical variates analysis or for example the R software environment uh, implementing the same canonical variates analysis uh, the, this is a print skin of the of the plugin. Uh, it's uh, uh, of the ImageJ software with the plugin. Uh, so basically, there is a menu tools. You go to the dimensionality reduction task uh, uh, sub menu, and then from there you select uh, one of the of one of the dimensionality reduction methods uh, written in MATLAB or or in uh, C. Uh, this is um, the canonical variates analysis uh, method in MATLAB, page uh, 102, um, which is uh, considered to be a very good result. Um, now, uh, so th at the present time, uh, this plugin uh, um, uh, has a MATLAB implementation, so can uh, access this uh, MATLAB functions, uh, canonical variates analysis. Uh, Generalized discriminant analysis method uh, and so on, but uh, the disadvantage of this uh, MATLAB implementation is the computational time. Uh, for example, on a proce processor 3.5 gigahertz Intel Core i5 with uh, 16 gigabytes of memory, the canonical variates analysis method uh, took uh, 25 minutes uh, to complete, which includes the time to read the multispectral images and to produce the new images. So the idea was to uh, try to use a different uh, programming language than MATLAB, like uh, C programming, for example, and to use a software library for numerical computation, such as uh, a scientific library. Um, the way it would work, so you basically you would write uh, the canonical variates analysis method in C language, and then you uh, compile it as a JNI lib uh, library file, which is called by Java. Um, so then uh, we uh, we did this, um, and then uh, we attach this uh, library, JNI library, uh, implementing the canonical variates analysis methods in C programming, uh, using the scientific uh, library GNU. And then uh, this um, uh, this methods uh, took uh, let's say 80 seconds maximum uh, to complete, uh, which includes also the time to read the multispectral images and to produce the new images. Uh, in the pictures again is a print um, uh, a, a the screen uh, a print screen uh, showing the eigenvectors obtained by the obtained by the canonical variates analysis uh, implemented. Um, Right. Uh, this this is a video. I may uh, come back uh, later. But uh, um, right. And this is the uh, canonical variates analysis in uh, C um, yeah, implemented uh, for this uh, plugin. Uh, as it took 80 seconds. This I, th I think this is the best. Uh, I produce about eight uh, images, and this is I think the best uh, result. Uh, maybe some some people ask me why is this result different from the from uh, the previous one, uh, which would be this one. Is because the MATLAB uh, 
software which is different from uh, uh, the GSL scientific library and calculating the eigenvectors are obviously different libraries and I can tell you that uh, um, the signs of the eigenvectors were different that's why uh, it uh, ended up in green not in blue and so on. Um, I, I could also, this is a video here, I, I don't know, uh, um, there is there is still time, I could uh, run it, uh, this video. Uh. Right, so this is basically the image J, I, I go um, uh, in the in the tools, uh, no, uh, yeah, once again. So tools, dimensionality, deduction, task. I, I chose the canonical variance analysis method in C language. I press OK. And then uh, you have the, the explorer, the finder here. And uh, in just uh, in one minute, uh, it should, uh, well, I can leave it for one. You see uh, the, um, how the images will start to be produced. Uh, maybe I can. Uh, so, yeah, so basically here it's 45 seconds, so maybe if I click here, 1 minute and 12. Yeah, so you okay, okay, you already can see the images being produced there in the finder. Yeah, they are already here. Okay, and then it producing the other seven images. Yeah, so, right. Um, Right, and I, I, th I thought to uh, add also a number of uh, uh, images uh, that I produce uh, for the Galen uh, Palimpsest um, for the scholars. So this is uh, another page obtained with CVA, but with the MATLAB. Uh, because I, I obtained them uh, two months ago before actually finishing the C version. Um, this is another page. Uh, Uh, another page. Mm. Uh, they, they, I chose these ones because I, I thought they like uh, better results. I mean, you can see some more uh, under text. Uh, of course, uh, somebody will have to uh, assess them. Already they are assess them, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, another page. No, I think this is this is good. I I think I don't know is <laughs> uh, another one. And another one. Right, so conclusion, uh, conclusions and deduction methods will apply successfully to the page 102v107. Uh, and other f and another 52 pages of the Galen Palmses. Uh, the CVA method showed the best result uh, confirmed by the evaluation indexes Davis, Boldin, and Dunn index. Uh, good to image J allows fast selection of image points from a palimpsest page and the selection of a MATLAB dimensionality reduction function. Uh, the CVA function in MATLAB is uh, computationally expensive. Uh, on that uh, computer. So uh, I program uh, um, a, C, uh, a C version SL scientific library, which uh, takes uh, less time, uh, 80 seconds. Oh, no. yeah. Thank you. Um, everything today that's been discussed is a very limited range of the electromagnetic spectrum. If, if the uh, text itself that's on a uh, parchment as inorganic elements in it that are differentiated from the background that give a, a higher probability of and uh, a clearer image. Are those types of techniques being uh, taken advantage of if they exist or are they being pursued? So, so um, some of us have had experience using some of these other techniques. So I've used XRF on synchrotrons and uh, played with things like Raman spectroscopy and uh, Fourier spectroscopy. And they all work, and they will give you a lot more information. And they were used on the Archimedes palimpsest and proved to be very, very useful. Um, the difficulties with them is that they often are really only very happy working on quite small objects. Finding someone that can actually cope with something big um, is difficult. And the other problem is that parchment friendly. 
Um, so you often have to, uh, I mean, they are you know, non-invasive. They're not destroying anything. But things like the humidity level where the paper has to, the parchment has to be, it can often be very low, or there might be partial vacuum involved. And all of these things are difficult to persuade librarians that uh, this is a good idea for, uh, for, for their book. So, so the idea is, I think, that if we find a particularly important section that's really key, so I mean, if we found the colophon or something like that that we really wanted and we couldn't actually read it properly, as well as we wanted to, then obviously we would try and make the case that perhaps we could use one of these other techniques. But I think the job at the moment is to, is to work as hard as we can with the information that we've got. And I think, as, as Will Nell said, that you know, that's, that is the, the obligation before we go back and, and say, well, could we try something else at this point? Because you know, every time you interact with the, with the document, there is a risk of doing more damage. And some of these techniques are, you know, are not things that you can necessarily do in the confines of the reading room. And of course, that is more difficult. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, whether you sort of like like the chemicals that they used to use to improve the visibility, that sort of thing. <laughs> Non-destructive. <laughs> non yeah. Well, yeah. I, yeah. I mean, that, that there may well be, and I'm sure one of the things I am absolutely you know, the manuscript will still be around in a hundred years' time, and there will be all sorts of fancy new techniques. And what we really don't want to do is 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 rush to use the latest new technique without knowing that it will absolutely produce a result that we want if there's any chance of risking you know, damage to the thing. Because you know, it's not going anywhere. And we might like to read it now, but, but actually we, we could learn a bit of patience. We don't want to be known as the people who, who went around Europe wrecking manuscripts for you know, <laughs> in 50 years' time when people... I, mean, I, I keep thinking back to this, so the archaeologists of the 19th century who were always blamed for, for you know, stripping tombs empty of this, that, and the other. You know, they were doing the best they could at the time but you can't necessarily go back. I'd like to ask a question. I think it's mainly addressed to Doug, perhaps to all three of you, and it ties into your question, and that is the accommodation of new techniques within the, the metadata, within uh, the description of the objects. That's from the point of view, I guess, of the people organizing it. How ready is it, or how it, might it be able to accommodate new techniques that involve keeping track of different types of information. For example, now this is for the, the, the analysts. Uh, there may be other information that's useful to scholars in selecting which images to view to get at questions you know, that are important to interpreting the data. Uh, I don't know that it's important to scholars to know whether something's supervised or unsupervised, but I can imagine there may be information that would be useful. Well, the, you know, I think the idea behind the data set is that it is, you know, it's what we have at the time that represents the best digital imagery and what's necessary in order to interpret that. One of the things that uh, I thought about early in the, well, not that early, but in the Archimedes Palimpsest project, I said, oh, well, maybe we could stick articles or something like that in here. And Will said, no, I mean, we're not doing that. All we're doing is providing enough information to understand what this data set is, and then to allow other people to add to it. And I think it's always a question when you decide, okay, what do you put it, make as a part of that data set, and what do other people provide by pulling the data out and then adding information elsewhere? And if someone wants to take the data and create a new version of it that then incorporates what they have that adds to it, I think that's an appropriate thing to do and something that encourages encourage them to do. As time goes on, we may apply some of these new techniques. Does that seem like a major rework of how things are done I'd have to know, I'd have to know what they were and what they involved. If it means adding more images, uh, and there's an appropriate way 
a data set? I would say certainly. And if, that, if it's accompanied by metadata, then I would say, yes, let's do that. I think that what we'd want to do is make sure that it, that it, what we didn't end up with was kind of a big patchwork or a hodgepodge of different types of metadata and different types of data so that it, where there's a certain sort of unity to the structure of it so that it would continue to make sense to people. I mean, one of the things that's difficult about working with data sets like this and that you know from, you know, when we've worked on these together, so that when the imaging was done with the Syriac Galen Palimpsest, we had, as um, Mike was saying, we had imaging going down in the basement of the building, and then we had on the fifth floor, we had imaging processing. We were moving these hard drives back and forth. And the result is this kind of real sort of nightmarish, you know, legislation sausage mess that you end up with that has to then be turned into something that you can present to people. And that's a lot of the, the difficulty. So I wouldn't want to start introducing that kind of fragmentation into the, the data set itself. And one of the things that, that, that we're obliged to do as part of the AHRC is to curate the data that we generate. I mean, it's a, an absolute requirement that we had to write a considerable, really long document about how we were going to do it because obligation to make data available for at least 30 years and we have a, an aspiration that it will be usable in 100 years um, and exactly how we will do that is it, something that we put a lot of thought into um, and obviously we'll discuss it with people here but you know it, it, it is something that there's no point doing all this work if people can't actually take advantage of it. Question that, that follows along with the idea of curating the data, and I, I guess my question is where. I, I mean, I appreciated the the uh, clarity of the open um, you know, presentation of it's very simple, where you can find what you want and so on. But I guess my question is where the responsibility lies to make it visible. Like, so you you know that the the information about the images for the Galen the Galen palimpsest lies here, do what you want with it. But surely there's a world in which it's important that um, people be able to discover that it lies here and that they might want to do something with it. And I'm wondering where that, where that, here's all the good stuff, where the responsibility for not curating the data itself but making it visible to uh, a world is. Yeah, I, there's there's a kind of tension there, right? You it, it, it right. So as soon as you start building, adding things to it that make the thing discoverable, then business of building interfaces. And of course, what we have is a kind of is a kind of interface, but it's intended to be a static interface. That is, here is the structure. And if you go to this folder, or this folder, or this document, or this document, you're going to discover that the same structure lies there. And so the answer of where the good stuff is, in short right now, is, well, unfortunately, you kind of have to learn how the thing works. And hopefully, our conventions are such that we do it that way again and again and again, enough that people will know where to go. Or, alternatively, that someone takes the data and provides some sort of uh, front end that doesn't actually alter this in internal structure that does expose it for us. And people are doing this kind of thing. Um, there's something that's coming up that I can't really talk about having to do with a project that, that we're associated with that, that really does that sort of exposure without actually, by reading actually live that's, that's on an existing website that makes it discoverable. So I guess just to follow up a little bit, um, so you've got a front-end producer and a, a person who's or a, an institution, whatever structure that's, that's responsible for curating the basic data. My, my, um, what I'd really like to know is to what extent the structure that's curating the data has a, um, a, a superordinate responsibility to um, point people from the data to the front ends that may be created on the basis of it. And you may say that there is no responsibility and that that's fine, but I, I do think that it's an interesting, um, it's a different, um, different level of curation. Will has indicated, I think you'd like to say something to that? Yeah, so, um, so what the data sets on open, uh, the water's 
Art Museum illuminated manuscripts are, are the most easily available manuscripts in the world because people have taken it from open and they've put it on the flip. And then you can point back to So if you Google illuminated gospel books, you won't get the Rhythm Swan Gospels, you won't get the Book of Kells, you won't get the Harvey Golden Gospels, you get what's done before, which is cute. Uh, but neither of them. Um, with other data on open, so for example, with digitizing diaries um, across the Philadelphia uh, the diary of Jeff, the, the assassination account of, um, of uh, President Lincoln by James Patterson exists in shorthand only at the Union League in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, we digitize that for them and make it available on open. And then they like, they, they haven't got a digital infrastructure, but they've got a website. They embed a book reader and they live stream it from open and it's available on their website. So inherent in the whole open philosophy is working with working with people to help them make all sorts of different And we've just got a, uh, a half a million dollars from the Mellon Foundation to digitize every medieval manuscript in Philadelphia and put, it, and put them on it. And for that, if we're not just going to be putting on, on, them on open, we're going to be working with the individual institutions so that they can manipulate the available on their website. So basically the answer is, with uh, the research that you're Pointers lies with the front end. It's, it's distributed, not central to open. Yeah, I think that's right. But also, one of the wonderful things about open is that data is the way Doug makes it. So, for example, the Art Media's data is has been ingested in the Cambridge University Library and into in the Stanford Digital Library. The Walter's data has been ingested into the Stanford Digital Library. And they may make it available. Uh, in that, uh, which are, for example, triple <coughs> compliant, which the moment isn't. So it's, it's promiscuous data. It, it, it actually gets around quite well. And I think that one of the great pedagogical possibilities of open is is that students can start to build um, to build off open, to build interfaces off open, which is what um, Isabella Meinhardt did uh, with uh, with LGS to a one million. And then she takes it and she makes her interface, which we help her with, and, and she's got a, an interactive entity track. And I want to add to that. One of the ideas of each one of these little each one of these little things that's on open, or the entirety of the Archimedes data, or the entirety of the Galen data, is a package. And it should be this autonomous thing that doesn't have that you can depend on, but it doesn't have dependence. So today I was scrolling through some of the documentation. So, oh, there's a link here that is that on Galen. There's a link to an outside standard that we're using. And, this, and the link broke because the site has moved. And I said, damn it. And then I went and found what I needed to find. But I, the idea is that this thing is sitting here, and then you can come and get it. It's not purporting to link out to other things. It, it lacks those elements that dynamic applications very often have. Not that linking out to other things is an inherent component of that. And so it is this little packet of stuff that's intended to have a kind of autonomy and long that isn't reliant on other things, which is a large part of that curating. And it's, and it's really it's a matter of design. And it's a, it is a hard, I say hard because I, you know, we, we never, we try as much as possible, try to follow these hard and difficult decisions that mean that we provide the data and we try not to make any decisions about how you're going to use it and make that as easy as possible. Uh, and as part of doing that, we don't have dependencies like that. Well, no more questions, let's thank our speakers again.